welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm your host, Chris Collins, and today we'll be talking with 2nd Berkshire State Representative Paul Mark about a variety of issues. Before we get to that, though, quick explanation about this program, which is relatively new to FCAT, and I want to explain sort of the concept. We have a couple of shows we've been doing. We've been doing this show and also South County Spotlight, which will focus mostly on local politics. But Beacon Hill Update is going to talk about issues that affect not just the towns of Conway, Deerfield, Sunderland, and Whitley, but also all over the region. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have Paul Mark in today. Uh, Paul Mark represents the second Berkshire district, which includes the town of Greenville, but mostly that district includes towns in Berkshire County. He also uh, represents the town of Northfield. We'll talk, by the way, about the pipeline a little bit because it directly affects the town of Northfield and affects a lot of people here in South County. But first, Paul, thanks for joining me and coming down and, and making some time. Uh, lots to get to, but the first thing I want to talk about is Bernie Sanders. Now, you recently opened for Bernie Sanders at a rally that packed the Mullen Center. This is shortly before Super Tuesday, in which Bernie Sanders really did very, very well out here in Western Mass. Mm -hmm. Not so much in the Boston and Springfield areas, in the more urban areas, which allowed Hillary Clinton to actually win uh, the popular vote. But um, why is Bernie Sanders a candidate you have chosen to throw in with? Well, it's an interesting story because, first of all, I was actually the first elected official in Massachusetts to endorse Bernie, and I'm co-chair of his statewide campaign, as it, as it were, in Massachusetts. And, and when you talk, you mentioned the popular vote. So in, in a primary here in Massachusetts, it's not winner-take-all right. like the Electoral College. So the delegate split between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders was actually pretty close. So the funny story I tell about why did I end up endorsing Bernie Sanders is that in 2008, I was part of a small team of union members that were assigned to drive Bill and Hillary Clinton around New Hampshire I remember this during term. the 2008 New Hampshire primary. So for the last two weeks of the primary, like Bill Clinton, I'm in the motorcade driving them around all over the state, lots of fun. I was with them on the night that Hillary Clinton won the presidential primary in 2008 in New Hampshire. And what I always tell people is, but they never sent me a thank you note. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but no, I, I, I tell that for two reasons. I tell it first because it's funny, but also because I don't want people to think that this is like because I don't like Hillary Clinton or because yeah. it's, it's an anti-Hillary Clinton thing. No. The thing is that Bernie Sanders is the first presidential candidate I've seen, maybe forever, but definitely in a very long time, who is talking about issues that I talk about all the time, that people in this region are talking about all the time, and that I think people have been hungry for someone to talk about and really bring them to the forefront. And we're talking about universal health care. We're talking about relief for student debt and student loans and, and making sure everybody can get into higher education. We're talking about the environment. And probably not the biggest, but, but a big thing and a very important thing and one where he is completely unique, he is talking about campaign finance reform. And he's not just talking it, he's living it. Yeah, and I, uh, one of the reasons why I was moved to vote for him, and I, I rarely disclose my votes, but I did so in my column, because I, I feel like everybody talks about helping the middle class. Right. Regular working people like us, everybody talks about it, and every candidate tries to get that vote because it's a big part of the populace that you want that support of that demographic. Right. Bernie Sanders is the only candidate I've seen this year that when I hear him say it, I actually believe that he believes. And that's because he spent the last 30 or 40 years doing you know, everything he could to help the people in that demographic. No, absolutely. And um, we were talking offline before the show started. When you look at Congress, and especially the U.S. Senate, it's almost completely comprised now of millionaires. Yeah. And Bernie Sanders isn't one of those people. He's a person. He's he, up in Vermont. He was the mayor of Burlington. He was a congressman. Then he was a U.S. Senator. And every time he's run for one of these races, he's overcome these odds. Nobody thinks he has a chance to win. And so, yeah, I think he really does believe in, in the middle class. I think he's proven it time and time again with his record. And again, the, the campaign finance thing is huge because when you decide the way you're going to run your campaigns is you're not going to take money from certain groups, let's say Wall Street, big money, what, what, whatever, whatever the case is, you do that at your own peril because it is so much easier to just take money. Someone's offering you all this money, take it, have the super PACs, have the dark money. It boosts your chances of winning. But when you make that decision, not you're, you are basically saying, I'm going to tie a hand around my back and I'm still going to try to fight. And to come as close as he's coming, people will say to me like about Massachusetts, well, he should have won Massachusetts. This is a liberal place. The Clintons have been campaigning since 1992. Right. And this is a senator that won't take super PAC money. So the fact that it was close, he, Bernie Sanders didn't have a former president of the United States running around on primary day and the night before rallying people. They had me. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I'm happy and the people out here responded to the fact that I was helping. But it's obviously not the same level as Bill Clinton showing up for something. 
she's got a pretty big, as we're shooting this, delegate lead. Mm -hmm. Can he hope to beat her at the convention, or is this, or is he in the race because he wants to be able to play a role in shaping the platform? I think at this point he's in to win, and he's still in to win even after Super Tuesday. If you look at the pure delegate count, it's within I think about a hundred delegates. If you count people that have actually been elected delegates, the super delegates don't count. If you go back to 2008, at this point in the election, um, Hillary Clinton had a substantial lead in super delegates. But super delegates aren't committed; they can change their mind. So it's like Congressman McGovern, Congressman Neal. They count as super delegates to the convention. They're just what it really is. It's you're an ex officio member mm -hmm. that goes to the convention no matter what you are in. Uh, but they don't have to pledge themselves, they can change their mind. And if Bernie Sanders wins every primary from here on out, the superdelegates are not going to make it that he can't be the nominee. It's just not the way it works. And when you look back again at 2008, Obama lost 21 of the states, mm -hmm. including Massachusetts. And he lost Massachusetts big, whereas Sanders came really close. And obviously he's been the president for eight years, so it's, 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 it's not over. But that being said, I think regardless, it is important that he's in this race for because of the issues that he's bringing up, but also because it's keeping the Democratic Party in the spotlight. And when you look at a primary, if all of a sudden tomorrow Bernie Sanders drops out, all of a sudden there is no excitement at all on the Democratic side. It's just people getting ready, but you don't know who you're going to face on the other side. So you're going to have Republican debate, Republican debate, Republican primary. They're going to be dominating the news and nothing on our side. So it's important to keep a primary going for a while, especially until you know who, who your eventual opponent's going to be. So are you a super delegate? I am to the state level convention, but I'm not to the national convention. But you want to go to the national convention. Yeah, I'd like to go as a delegate. I can either be elected as a delegate or I can be what they call a pledged elected official, uh, where you have to be like a state representative, something like that. You have to be an elected official, but you're pledged. So it's not like a super delegate where you can change your mind later. You, you have to commit to one of the candidates. So how do you get in a position where you can be named a delegate? Okay, so every congressional district, they're going to have a caucus. And I think the caucus day is going to be April 9th. And so for the second congressional district where this is right now, uh, the caucus is going to be in the Worcester area. I don't know where. So if you're a Hillary Clinton supporter, you go to the Hillary uh, caucus. If you're a Bernie supporter, you go to the Bernie caucus. And the delegates are allocated. I believe there's six delegates per congressional district and then one alternate. And they're allocated by how the candidate did out here. So out here, Bernie Sanders will probably get four of the six, and Hillary Clinton will get two. So you go to your caucus, and you have to be elected by everyone that shows up at the caucus. Well, I would think that, the, I mean, she really did well. I mean, he really did well, excuse me, in your district and mm -hmm. out here. And, mm -hmm. and that's got to make you feel good. I mean, it, it, like 70% seventy like seventy percent of the vote went for him yeah. in the western counties, which is unheard of. Yeah, it was great. It was, uh, it was close to 70% everywhere. It was over 70% in some towns. And 15 of my 16 towns all went for Bernie. So, yeah, it felt really good when you, when you endorse somebody. Um, you try, when, when I endorse somebody, I don't do it on paper, so I'm, I'm actually pretty rare when I endorse somebody. When I, when I endorse, it means I'm going to work for them, I'm going to be around, I'm going to make sure that people understand why I'm doing such a thing. And so for people in this area to respond, I mean, you can look at it chicken or the egg, either it was part of what I was saying they were, they were liking, or just something that the people in this district like is something that I'm on board with anyway. But e either way, it felt great. Do you think that, what do you think is his, his, his charm, his appeal to people out here? Out here, I think that he's is talking the populist no message. Is yeah, that, yeah. I think it's populist. I think we're in uh, my district, Franklin and Berkshire counties, are two of the poorest counties in the state, and I think we're sick of people telling us the same old thing that if we just keep cutting taxes, that it's going to make jobs appear, and it's not true. If it was true, it'd be happening for the last thirty years, and it's not happening. So I mean, you don't have to talk about raising taxes necessarily, but you talk about where you're spending the money. So people will say. Well, he's going to give us universal health care. How are we going to pay for that? Well, the answer is this country, we pay more per person than any other industrial nation in the world that already has universal health care. So maybe we'll just do it smarter. Or we talk about like higher education. How is he going to pay for student debt? Well, we'll reallocate the money so that if we don't do something, if we don't do something smarter and soon, we're all going to be end up paying for it anyway because we're going to end up bailing out these people that can't afford their student debt someday. So I mean, it, 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 to me, it's being more proactive and, and putting resources in a better spot than they would be. And I think that's a very appealing message out here. We're, you know, we're, we're blue collar, we're rural, we're used to not getting a lot of stuff from the government. And so it, 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 it's, we're used to working together. And I think that it's, it's a good message. Since you opened the door to student debt, let's mm -hmm. talk about that because sure. this is one of your pet issues. And mm -hmm. you've been very involved in trying to convince your colleagues to, to put some real reforms in place. Mm -hmm. And you know of what you speak because you, you, you went to college, you took like the express route. You, <laughs> right. you went from an associate's degree to a to a law degree in like record time, but in the course of that, 
you racked up tremendous student loan debt. How much do you pay, if you, you don't mind saying? So the, the funny story is actually, I went through five degree programs in nine years, and I didn't rack up any student loan debt. And then I married my lovely wife, oh. and I, I married into her $750 a month for her one degree from UMass. So yeah, so we paid $750. So you inherited it. I inherited oh, that's, it. That's even, and, and that's like even more interesting. Say, she's worth every penny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, $750 a month. I mean, that's more than our mortgage. That's, that's, that's money we're not saving for retirement. We're not reinvesting in the local economy. It, it affects every single decision we make uh, and, and will make for I think she's got 20 more years to pay it. You co-chaired a subcommittee on this, and you went around to different parts of the state. And mm -hmm. it seemed like, this, from what I understand, the stories of student debt were pretty much universal, no matter where yeah. you went. And, and so where is that process now? I know you put forth a series of recommendations for legislative fixes. Yep. Where, are, where are those? Are any of those close to getting passed, or where are we? Right. Okay. So we, so we had the subcommittee. We issued a nine-point plan that was in the end of 2014. That translated into a bill that was filed at the beginning of January 2015, which was a 34-section bill. Very comprehensive, uh, omnibus, whatever you want to call it, uh, but, but containing many different uh, items to try to tackle this from a, a number of different angles. Not just throw money at anything, control costs, encourage savings, private-public partnerships, student loan forgiveness, a lot, lot of different programs. Where that sits right now is it's before the Higher Education Committee. I got over 60 or close to 60 co-sponsors, which is over a quarter of the legislature. So those are people that signed on to this as if it was their bill as well. Um, the committees have to report by the third week in March whether a bill is favorable, uh, unfavorable, or for greater study. And so that's about two weeks away from now. We'll know if it's going to come out of the uh, Higher Education Committee. Now, if it's not. determined to be need, needing more study, does that mean it's big, like locked in committee hopelessly? or No, what, what it means is as a broad package, it's going to need a little more uh, studying, uh, more people need to look at it. But regardless, we're going to go into the budget process. And so last year, people, including myself and others, filed uh, as budget amendments individual pieces of the bill. And uh, in addition to that, the Attorney General, she's been working on things that I'm not saying she got them from, from my subcommittee, but they are exactly in line. Same thing with Treasurer Goldberg. She's been doing a lot with financial literacy. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's having an impact. And one of the things we recommended that's non-legislative is partnering with other government officials. Like Elizabeth Warren is, is going around making a lot of noise about this because they have different powers, obviously, at the, at the federal level than we do. We can't change the interest rates, for example. But I, I think it's, it's gotten a lot of attention. It's something I want to keep bringing attention to. I filed a a resolution. I was one of 10 lawmakers from all over the country. We filed a resolution on the same day calling on our legislatures to come up with a way to make college debt free. And we're, and we're not talking about free, that everyone just goes to college for free. We're talking about debt free, that you get out, there's a way that it's paid for, you pay for it, who knows how you do it. There's many different aspects, there's different plans you can, you can go after. But in the end, that you're not going to be saddled with $750 a month in, in a payment. I mean, it's just... Like I said, it affects every kind of job you want to take. You think you want to do such, you want to be a lawyer, and you want to go into public interest law or, or criminal defense or whatever it may be. How do you do it when those loan payments start coming in? You can't. And so you end up going for the highest priced job, even if it's not what your heart was into. Is it possible that there would be a time when, as Bernie Sanders has proposed, college would be free to everybody? I mean, in Massachusetts, is that something that's even a possibility, or is it just sort of pie in the sky? I mean, it's something that's it's possible, but it's not something that I think is very likely anytime soon. I know President Obama, he proposed uh, free community colleges. I mean, that might be where we end up going, and some of it will be vocational, and some of it will be purely academic. Um, I mean, there's definitely a need, and I think we do public higher education better in this state than anywhere else in the in the world, and that's public and private uh, higher education. I mean, that's what we're known for. When we look at Massachusetts, we can't afford to let our higher education system fall behind. People don't move here because of the weather. They move here because we have the best employees, the best students, and the best institutions of higher learning in the world. And companies want to be located around that. And that's true here in the Valley. That's true in, out in the Boston area. And we need to make sure we're doing everything that we stay on the forefront of that. What about loan forgiveness? That's mm -hmm. one of the things that came up quite a bit, I think, during your discussions mm -hmm. with your subcommittee. Is that something that's a possibility or some type of a, of a way to at least reduce the rate, if not forgive loans entirely? Yeah, there, there is loan forgiveness. Uh, there's bills in the works. Part of them are part of my bill, and then there's also 
individual bills that were filed by other people, including myself. Um, one good example is social workers. So why would you give loan forgiveness to social workers? Because social workers need a master's degree, and if you just spent, say, $80,000 to get a master's degree, to then go take a job paying $35,000 a year, who's going to be attracted to be a social worker? But we need people to be social workers because it's an investment in this commonwealth. Social workers, every dollar you put into that, it's a dollar you're not spending on jail. It's a dollar you're not spending on drug uh, treatment later. It's, it's, it, it makes sense to encourage people into that. And in one of my subcommittee hearings, I even said, the greatest social worker in the world might be sitting in this audience, but they might never go after that job, even though they love it, because they know I'm never going to get ahead. I'm always going to be behind the eight ball, so why? Why do that? So there were, there were social workers, there was uh, for nurses, nurse practitioners, there was, there was a couple of programs. There's already a program in place for uh, teachers that go into the inner city. So I mean, it, it's a model that can work and has worked, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Let's move to another issue that's got huge regional concern, and that of course is the natural gas pipeline. Stan mm -hmm. Rosenberg was in the very chair you're sitting in now recently, and he said that, you know, he. One of the reasons why he's not all that concerned is because of Article 97, which is a constitutional provision that basically says you can't impact or, or otherwise deface land that's been protected without a two-thirds vote of the legislature. Right. He seems to view that as an ace in the hole. So the people that are worried about this pipeline, should they really be as worried as they have been? Or is that something you think will protect this region from that project ever happening? I think people that are worried about it should stay worried and should stay vigilant and should stay involved. Uh, I think it's important that if you want to stop this pipeline, you need to be hitting it from every single angle, and that's whether it's local government, state level government, federal government, or even as uh, private property owners and individuals. Now that being said, in Massachusetts we have a unique aspect to our constitution, as you mentioned, Article 97 that protects public lands, and no other state in the country has this. So ultimately what is expected to happen is for this pipeline to be granted uh, public lands that are protected right now, you would need a two-thirds roll call vote of both the House and the Senate. And that was set up by our own Senator Wetmore, who only recently passed away um, a long time ago to help protect local environment and rural areas. It has never happened, at least not that I'm aware of, and I don't think it's ever happened, um, that if the local representative and senator are against a land taking in their district, that the rest of the state voted against them. So I find it very unlikely that if I stand up and say I'm against this and Senator Rosenberg says he's against this and Representative Kulik says he's against this, that the rest of the state is going to vote us down because it could be them next. So there, I, I think our chances of denying Article 97 to the pipeline are very good. But that being said again, FERC still holds the final authority and the final say. Yeah, but if it goes to court, I mean, theoretically if it goes to court and FERC says, okay, it doesn't matter what you say, it's going to get challenged in court. Then it, right. it could potentially go to the Supreme Court. Sure. And, you know, it's possible, I suppose, the Supreme Court could overturn it, you know, on, a, on an appeal. But I, I don't see how likely that is. So, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert at the Constitution. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. But it is intriguing. And, and I, but I guess in terms of the pipeline itself, what, you say people should stay vigilant. Stay involved. What does that mean? Should they be writing the government? What should they be doing? It, what it means is don't take it for granted either way. Don't assume it's going to happen and give up. And don't assume, well, we have this Article 97, so we're safe. Keep talking to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of stopping the pipeline. Still write me a letter because it helps me when I get up on the floor someday to talk about why we need to deny this when I have a thousand emails printed up and I say, this is why I'm against this because the people at Northfield have sent me 2,000 letters <laughs> saying they don't want this compressor station have. in their backyard. That's why I'm taking the position I, I'm taking. Well, it really affects it their groundwater too directly. Absolutely. Yes. That town Absolutely. especially. But then also here in the South County, I mean, it could really, really devastate the, the environment. Mm -hmm. if in fact it is allowed to go through. And that's something you can't undo. Right. Um, you mentioned people should write you. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other steps people can take to get the government's attention other than what they've already done, which is go to a lot of these public hearings? Oh, absolutely. I mean, people, you should email, call, write, whatever you want to do, go to office hours with your local officials. I know Representative Kulik is very resp responsive. He's, he's been around a long time. I'm sure a lot of people in this watching this today have a personal relationship with him. And I think that's the same. Uh, the same could be said about all of the representatives and senators in this region. Uh, we, we, we want to hear from people. We want to make sure people are telling us because the more we hear from you, the better we are 
down in Boston advocating for you. But so any way, any way you can get in contact with him. So same thing with Congressman McGovern. Send him a letter. Go to his office. He has an office in Northampton. Let him know what you're thinking. We need to hear from you. If you don't know, then we assume everything's okay. It's a bit of a catch-22, though, because as a representative, you also have to worry about the economic impact of not having enough natural gas. And that moratorium that's in place makes it tough for people to sell houses, for people to open businesses. So there's that side of it, too. I mean, that's obviously got to be something that weighs on you a little bit as well. It's something to think about in Greenfield. But the interesting thing about Greenfield is where Greenfield is under the moratorium, the town council there sent me a letter stating their opposition, asking me to be against the pipeline. So I mean, I have to assume that they represent the interests of the people in, in Greenfield, and, and that's what you got to stick with. I know that the mayor, though, has been pretty strong in, in saying that there needs to be more natural gas capacity allowed to come in to be able to get the kind of development that that town needs. And, and most towns, I think, in this area, they need, there needs to be an, act, an availability of natural gas for businesses to expand or to come to, to Massachusetts. So there's that part of the argument, too. There's also the possibility, if you need natural gas to move forward economically, then why not focus on conservation right now? And, and why did Berkshire Gas decide all of a sudden there was a moratorium? Like, they gave us like a three-day notice. You're telling me you didn't see this a year in advance? But when we talk about the pipeline, there's no guarantee that any pipeline being built is going to change any of what we're talking about. There's right. no guarantee they're going to expand gas in Greenfield. And I know for sure they're not going to expand gas in Northfield, and they're not going to expand gas into the town of Windsor, which is 800 people, where they want to put the other compressor station in my district. And when we talk about price, I've heard this argument that it's going to make electricity prices go down. Well, nobody knows that. because. If you start expanding capacity, you're also going to increase demand. And if it goes up into Maine, which is part of what's driving this, and it goes down into Connecticut, the prices might even go up. And if there's export, and I went to a Department of Energy, Federal Department of Energy seminar uh, down in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they're all about export. And there's, you know, there's geopolitical reasons why that's a great idea, but it doesn't mean that if you expand capacity, prices are going to go down or there's going to be added availability anywhere. Let's shift gears to another issue that's come up recently. It's not so much an issue as much as it is an initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, the Senate, under Senator Rosenberg and Senator Lesser, are, are spearheading an effort to engage more millennial voters, mm -hmm. younger voters. Now, mm -hmm. you just barely got out of the sort of quote-unquote millennial <laughs> right. demographic, right. but you're one of the younger members yeah. of the House, yeah. and you're a young guy involved in politics. Is this a good idea? Is this something that le the legislature should be doing more to engage younger voters? Yeah, I think it is a good idea, and especially with the generation that they call millennials. I think that's people born 1980 or, or after. But so let, let's say starting in the 1990s, what I've been reading is that people that are that young really don't have any interest in politics. And maybe it's a byproduct of living in an instant world where they've always had email yeah. and they've always had Facebook. And, and so they're used to getting an answer to things right away or expressing themselves instantly and, and seeing results. And when you're talking about the system of government, well, our system of government in Massachusetts was established in 1780. And it still moves at a 1780 pace. <laughs> so sometimes that's frustrating for people yeah, even true. my age or your age. Uh, but uh, the good news is we haven't had a dictator since 1780. And that's what <laughs> it was. It was designed to work like that, that nothing crazy happens like that. Not yet, but there's always November. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like I think a dictator with orange hair. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I think it is important to make sure that um, all groups, whether it's younger people or, 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 or any group that generally either doesn't vote or feels ignored, is brought into the process. I, the reason I like politics is when I was eight years old, Dukakis was marching in the 4th of July parade, and he's running for president, and he shook my hand. And I, I thought, wow, how awesome is that, you know? So it, I think it's good to get people involved in a young age. And, and uh, you mentioned Senator Lesser. He's, boy, he might be 30 years old. He's, he's pretty young. Yeah. And at, at 36, I'm probably the 12th youngest member of the House, and I've been in three terms now. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really good to get people engaged. I would think with your efforts regarding student loan debt, I would think that'd be one of the top issues that, yeah. that millennials would care about. So I would think you, know, you would probably embrace this idea of good. bringing more youngness to the table, as it were. Yeah, I, I used to go to this young elected officials conference, and it was you have to be 35 or younger. And so the last one I went, I thought the last one I went to was last uh, was last summer, and then they told me, "Congratulations, you're now a young elected official mentor." <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I get to adopt a young elected and, and and teach them the ropes or something. I don't know. So, but but it's good. It, it keeps you it keeps you engaged. That like you turn a certain age, and all of a sudden you don't just forget that, and now you're part of a different group. You recently passed on a chance to run for the state senate. Mm. And mm -hmm. if you had taken that opportunity to run for Ben Downing, you probably would have won it. Mm -hmm. 
as we wrap up, I want to have you reflect a little bit. You know, it wasn't that long ago you were working, you were up on a pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Working yeah. As, a, as a pole worker for a, a telecommunications Verizon. for yep. Verizon. Yep. Yep. And now you're here and, mm -hmm. and you have a chance to influence policy that affects a great number of people. You're, you're a union guy through and through. Yeah. Do you ever sort of pinch yourself and say, how, how did I get from a pole wearing a hard hat <laughs> right. to the House of Representatives? <laughs> it, does it ever dawn on you that this has been quite a transformation for you? Yeah, it does once in a while. It, and, and where it really dawns on me is, is once in a while someone will say to me something about how it seems like I've been doing this forever or I'm such a natural at it and I say, yeah, five years ago I was I was climbing a telephone pole this February, you know. So or I was fixing payphones or whatever it might yeah. have been. Um, no, it, it it is interesting, but I I think it's actually really good. And I'm not just saying that because it's me. I think it's really good that a working class person was able to get an education and then was able to go ahead and try to fight for working class issues. I mean, I won I won an award from Community Action, the Sergeant Shriver Public Service Award, and uh, the speech I gave to end their annual meeting. Well, it talked about how when I was a kid, we were poor and we didn't have a water heater right. for five months. And remember that story. The room, the standing ovation, and I, I was bringing people to tears. I almost cried. And, it, it, and but just for someone to talk like that and to get rid of like the, that, there's not a stigma that you shouldn't be ashamed to be poor. You should be accept what it is and, and try to do better and try to make sure you're helping other people when you start doing a little better and make sure everyone else around you understands that someone that's poor, they're not poor because they're bad, they're poor because either they've fallen on a bad circumstance or they've overextended themselves or, or something. They just haven't had the same breaks other people have had. I think it's a perspective that not enough people in public life experience, which yeah. is one of the reasons why I've been very compelled to tell you that I think you, know, you, you represent a, a level of understanding that a lot of millionaire politicians will never understand, which is right. one of the reasons why I think, and I've said this before and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, kiss up to you when I say this. I think you, you are like the, you're like the young Steve Kulik. I see you as being the next generation of Kulik and Rosenberg, and I just hope you stick around. I, I was actually very happy to hear you stay in the House. Thank you. Because you had a good thing going there, but you would have been a good senator, but just as well to keep you in the House. And I appreciate, I appreciate you coming in and making time Thank and you. introducing yourself to our, our friends in the South County because you're, you're a rising star, Paul Mark. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Representative Paul Mark of the 2nd Berkshire District has been my guest. That's Beacon Hill Update for this week. We'll talk to you next week at the same time. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.